Hello and welcome to a new episode of my podcast, Purpose is the Pitch. I will do an experiment, a new type of format today. It's a solo podcast, only myself in English. And what I did is I choose a subject. The subject is vulnerability. And I would like to talk now about it. And what I did is I prepared myself not by writing down many interesting thoughts about the subjects, but what I did is I wrote down some questions I asked myself. And I just have here six questions I asked myself. And what I will do now is just talk about it and just see what's coming up and see how I would yeah, answer these questions. So this is the experiment. Let's see how it's coming out. So. Have fun. Thank you. Today I want to talk about vulnerability. I mentioned that term in my first solo podcast, K01, and I want to elaborate today a little bit more on this term. I think it's a very important thing. I would say that becoming vulnerable is the number one superpower we have as humans. And it's so interesting because it's a kind of power which is self-sufficient. We don't need anything for this power. We don't need money. We don't need wealthy power. We just need to be vulnerable. We just need to become vulnerable. If we compare people who are powerful in the meaning we usually look at it, if we compare those type of persons, heads of states, if we compare the different types of power, there is a type of power that is based on physical power. There's a type of power based on having money, having influence, having the ability to threaten people so that they do what we want, having a lot of resources available, these types of powers. And if we look on the other side, what I call the number one superpower of the human being, vulnerability. We see that vulnerability is self-sufficient. We don't need anything for that. Only we need to be courageous. We need to overcome certain fears and then we can become vulnerable. And this means, I would say, if we become fully vulnerable, we will be invincible. And I don't mean that only in the way of overcoming others, invincibility in the way of overcoming others. I mean more to be undestroyable. Because if we are vulnerable, we are true. We are true ourselves. And we, in our innerst kernel, in our innerst core, are undestroyable. I mean, there are very nice examples of the history Maybe take persons like Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela. These are figures in history and there are many more who went down this path of being vulnerable. Mahatma Gandhi, who changed a whole country, a whole big country, India, absolutely peaceful. He only could do that by becoming absolutely vulnerable. And these are big historic examples. So look on your own life and you will see if there is a certain situation where maybe you did something wrong. So you have a choice here. Either you try to hide this failure and the more you try to hide the failure, the more energy you need for hiding it. And other people have a sense for the truth. 
So because we have the fear then of being exposed and so we have to put a lot of energy in that. And then if somebody finds out, if we are exposed, yeah, it is a high fall. It is a destruction of, of the constructed personality we tried to pretend. And so we are very vulnerable here or this kind of personality, what we try to be, what we try to pretend is very vulnerable. Let's go back and let's look on the decision again and let's go now instead of making up a story for hiding the failure, go back and have a look on the other choice on being true, being vulnerable. So what happens then? Yes, then you will have, you will face certain feedback, you will face a certain storm of negative feedback. Somebody maybe will shout at you or somebody will be disappointed or somebody will tell you that there will be no consequences. Yes, maybe, but then you weathered this storm. I don't know whether you say in, in English to weather something. It's, it's a German expression, etwas abwettern. It means to just wait until the storm is over. And then you're still a true person. You still don't have to hide anything. You can be yourself. And there is an interesting thing that very often we will make the experience that the storm isn't that big as we have imagined it. Because there is a certain strange characteristic in our human mind. In our imagination, we tend to exaggerate the consequences, the scenarios that would happen if we would confess our failures. So in our imagination, there will be a big thing, a big problem. And so we think, oh my God, it's too big for me. I can't cope that. So I will... I will hide it. It's so easy now. Just hide it. Nobody will see it. So I'm very, very, very safe here. And so, and this is a characteristic or a mechanism that leads us to this constructions of pretended truths, of pretended realities. And again, I want to emphasize that if we stay with the truth here, if we stay vulnerable, we will be surprised by very often, not always, but very often by the mild, mildness of the reaction of our, of our environment. And it even can happen that you will get high appreciation for your truthfulness. So, and again, If we are vulnerable, we are invincible as human beings, as persons. Even if we will have to carry consequences, in our innerst core, we are safe and we are healthy, we are sane. So I know that being absolutely true without filter, and this is a Will be, will be maybe another podcast. It is maybe sometimes a problem. I would say truthfulness sometimes has, let's say, also the task to, to be kind. So truthful, truthfulness should not hurt people. I'm sure that this can be done. It can be done to be true, to sometimes it is tough for others. I would say in 99.9% of the cases, people can take the truth. But as I said, I think this is another podcast about how to be truthful always. So a second aspect I would like to talk here now is that becoming vulnerable is not only positive for the individuum, but it is the only way 
to heal our global society, I think we can only have an, a healthy, a sane society if we are vulnerable to each other. There is no other way. We all know a lot about what's going on on this planet, on this little, little blue, beautiful paradise within a vast, empty, cold, dark universe. It's a very cozy place. It can be a very cozy place. I know that there are millions, millions of humans now, in this moment, experiencing a hell on this earth. Hell on earth is a reality now. And I would say there are only very few people who experience the opposite at the moment, heaven on earth. But there are some, they experience heaven on earth. And as I already mentioned before, it is within the possibility, within the ability of each and every human being. So even if you are living at the moment on hell, there is a chance for you to come into the heaven on earth, not on, in the heaven after death or something like that. No, to come to heaven on earth. The heaven on earth maybe is not always a place where you have a luxus, where you have, how do I say, a luxurious life, where you have everything. Ah, it's a... Big thing what I'm saying here, that heaven on earth is possible for everybody now. I would say, I would still say yes. I would say yes in any circumstances it is possible. But I would say this is a very advanced view on it. So let's start with a smaller step. Let's start on how can we gain vulner vulnerability in our society. I I'm 100% convinced that if we are moving to that, our society will become better, warmer, more loving, more helping, but also, also clearer, more transparency, no hidden agendas. This hell on earth, what is experienced by so many people at the moment, will fade away if we start going into this direction. Not only because we as an individual create our own heaven on earth, what maybe really is very, very hard. It's a very high level that, that, that um, is maybe too high for, for, for many people or will be too high for many people. So what can we do instead of that? And instead of that, we can start moving the whole society into a direction of more togetherness. I don't want a, a society where, where we all are like ants the same, you know, there's no difference between each other and everybody has to somehow follow the, the rules of the, of the common interests. No, this is not what I mean. But if I look at our life, there is, it's like, like, a, like a polarity between the separateness of us as an individuum, the absolutely absolute individuality of each of us on the one side and on the other side, there is something like a connectedness, a togetherness of each and everybody. And at the moment, it is like a little bit like a historical dialectic transformative process that we are going through as humanity a little bit like Hegel, the philosopher, um, has described it. There was, if we look at the, at the kingdom of animals, we see there is a total connectedness, a total oneness. Animals are 100% connected with the world, with the nature, with themselves, with, with their, with their, with their um, species. And then the human somehow, the human mind somehow woke up and experienced itself as an individual, as a separated being, as an I. And 
this experience enabled us to perceive our world consciously, to perceive ourselves consciously, to think about ourselves, to, to have a picture of us, of our life, of our universe, of our earth, of many, many things. So we are now able to distinguish, we are able to analyze, but it comes with a price. And the price is the feeling of separateness, the feeling of being alone. And with this feeling of being alone, there comes the fear. And I'm not talking about the natural fear that maybe an antelope has if a lion comes around the corner. So this is a very useful fear to survive. What I mean is this fear, what is coming out of our imagination. This is what I mentioned before when I talked about people who make up false stories in order to hide their faults. This type of fear. So this is the price we are paying here. And my vision is that we slowly, step by step, move into a direction that would, this would be the third step, the synthesis of this dialectic move, would be that we again start to experience and to understand our connectedness, but on a higher level, because still we, we remain individuals, we remain conscious about who we are, conscious about our world, conscious about our uniqueness, but it is not the total separation anymore. It is, yeah, the uniqueness within the oneness. And it's so interesting because there is this word, there are several word, words for the world. The one word is world, yeah, okay. Um, but there is the very ancient Greek word cosmos, and cosmos means order. So it's the order. It's a kind of thing that has a big order. It's a big order of everything. And then there is another word we call universe. And the word universe is a Latin word, universum. And it's, um, it's a mixture or it's, it's a synthesis of two words of unity and diversity. So it is already expressed in very ancient language. So somehow already people 2,000, 3,000 years ago had a glimpse of what I'm talking here. And I also only have a glimpse of what I'm talking here. So they had a glimpse already about that there is a strange paradox, parallelity, sameness of there is a unity and a diversity at the same spot, at the same moment. I don't go into physics and quantum physics. Um, the wave and the particle are also somehow the, in the same spot or how language could explain it. So, but as I'm, I'm not a physicist, I keep away of that. It would be interesting to have somebody talking about that in my podcast, but at the moment I um, stay on the philosophical and maybe a little bit spiritual point of view here. So, and my vision is that our society starts to reinvent or not to reinvent, to remember that we are united also and that the unity is somehow the basis of everything. So let's say today we are 
80% or 90% in the feeling of separation, and some people maybe even 99% or even 100%, but let's say in average we have 90%, 80 to 90% the feeling of separation. And the other 10 or 20%, we have moments of unity. If we are in deep love, if we are in the nature, there are these moments. And my vision is that we start to move into a direction of, let's say, 51% unity and 49% diversity. Something like that. It would be a real shift. And we still would be individuals. We still could have our personal life stories but we wouldn't have to fight for our lives every moment, every single second. Because we would know that there is something very big that we are part of. So, and as I already mentioned, I think it is a very, very, very high level very hard to achieve for an individual, for a single person. There are some who achieve that. Some people call them enlightened people, but I don't think that necessarily we have to call those people enlightened, but they are somehow balanced. They are relaxed. And I'm sure all of you know such a person in, in, in your life. So, and, but it is so hard for many of us, for the most of us, for 80, 90, 95% of us, it is really hard to get into that balance. So what can we do for that? I would say, let's start to move the whole society into a direction of more vulnerability. This is my suggestion. And before I now go into that, I first would like to talk a little bit about why, why, do, we, why do we shield ourselves? Why is it so hard to become vulnerable? What is the mechanism behind that? This is the question I ask myself. I don't have answers on everything here, I have to tell you. I, I'm, I'm just asking questions. I ask myself and I let, let you participate on these questions I ask myself. So I'm not a lecturer here. I, I don't have a script where I have already all the answers. I have only written down here on my script. My script for this little podcast is just some lines and these lines Oh, what's coming out here? And these lines are questions. So the question is, why do we try to shield ourselves? So I talked already a little bit about this imagination we have. The imagination of the punishment, um, what we would receive by whoever, by our environment, by other people, by, I don't know, maybe by even th there is a fantasy of that there is a God who punishes us or other people who punishes us or, or who are punishing us or, or, or uh, the judge who is punishing us um, or our boss or our colleagues. And my question here is now, wh where does it come from, this imagination? And so... One little hint do we get in our days, and again here I'm not an expert, I'm just thinking a little bit about that. We do get from the biology, from what they call epi epigenetics. The epigenetics is the science about the expression 
the materialization of the genome. So imagine there is a the genome, it's it's a, like a like a like a thread in our cell, and this thread is one meter long, but one meter is very big for a cell. A cell is very small, so it is somehow folded, very tiny folded into our cell. And this genome is a vast structure of information, a three-dimensional structure of information. So there's a lot of information in this genome, way more than the single cell needs as a blueprint. The genome is the blueprint for every cell. Every cell reads out of the genome what, what, how it should express itself. So, so how does the cell understand, or how does understand, how does the cell cell, cell know what what part of the genome of this huge amount of information it should read? It should. It only needs a little part of this manual. So only a very, 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 very little part. And so there's something happening that the scientists call metallization. So this means. Let's imagine that there is, from this thread, there's a little loop coming out and now the cell can, can read this little part. And this, epi, this, this is what the science calls epigenetics. And what is so interesting is, I'm sure many of you already are aware about that, is that if we look at the evolution theory of Darwin, um, there was always very clear that a change of the genome is only going by mutation, so by chance. So this means if we change ourselves, if we, if we give a change to our children, it is by chance that they change some features. So and this is why evolution goes very, very slow. There are little chances, little features changing, and then there is the survival of the fittest. So which version is working better, is adapting better to the environment, has a better chance to survive, and this version is surviving, and so species are changing very slowly over many, many generations. What was very clearly excluded that personal experiences of my personal life span would be inherited by my children because my experiences would not have any influence on my genome. So it wouldn't put any changes to my genome. So there is no way of in heritage of the children's that for, for the, for the, for the experiences of their parents. So now the epigenetics shows us a different picture because the, our personal experiences have a huge influence on our epigenetics. And again, our epigenetics have a huge influence on who we are, on our emotions, on our health, on how we express ourselves in our life. So this means and it's just a philosophical theory. It's not a scientist, scientific um, theory I'm putting out here. Is that there is a possibility that we somehow inherit the experiences of our parents. And not only our parents, but also our grandparents and grandgrandparents. And maybe even further. So the pictures in our mind, the imaginations, where are they coming from? What did our grandparents and great grandparents experience? Think about World War II, World War I, that's a lot. So this means that if we feel that we have to protect ourselves against big, big threats and big danger events that might happen if we act in a certain way, if we behave in a certain way, if we be true, then um, 
these fears might come from other places. So we cannot find them in our own life. And this is something that um, is mesmerizing. It is somehow confusing for us. So let's imagine there is a person who had a very protected life, protected childhood, everything fine, nice school, nice friends, nice parents, and everything safe and enough food. And, but still this person always acts in a way as if it will starve soon if, if it, if it, if it ta doesn't take care and if it doesn't try to grab everything it can or it's just an example. Yeah. So, and this person doesn't know where it comes from, right? Isn't it interesting? So the question is, what can we do? How can we gain vulnerability? How can we gain our strength? How can we take back our power? And I would say there are several paths to that. There are many people who are working on that already in the world. I think there is one expression, we call it locus of control, that can help us here. It is that in each and every situation we have a look at the situation and look what is the part of the situation we cannot influence and what is the part of the situation which is in our control. Because there is always a locus of control in each and every situation. I talked about already a lot about Viktor Frankl, who is a very extreme example for that, who was in the concentration camp, and not only just in one concentration camp, but in several concentration camps, and really in the worst, in the worst ones, in Auschwitz, in Dachau. So really in the bad, bad concentration camps, absolutely hell on earth. The worst you can imagine. And he thought about, he somehow had the strength to think about this question of the locus of control within this experience. And he asked himself, what, what can I control here? Is there anything left that I can control? And he found himself in a situation where he couldn't control anything in the outer world. He couldn't control whether he would freeze to death or not, or whether he would get something to eat or not, or whether he would be beaten to death or, or shot to death, whether he can sleep or he has to stay, get up, no control at all. But he found the space, he found a locus of control, and it was his mindset. He started to control his mindset. How do I behave in this situation? And he started to control his imaginations, and he started to imagine positive things. He started to control even his perception. He started to see the beauty of the world still in this situation. He started to see the connection between humans, but also the disconnection. And he even was able to see the inner tyrants that were working within the bad people in this game, within the waiters, within 
other people who were imprisoned together with him and went to the bad side. Because if you are in such an environment, it's not easy to remain on the good side. So Viktor Frankl is a very big example for that, for this locus of control story. Um, and I think we don't have to experience that. We don't have to go into a concentration camp and be then strong in order to find our um, locus of control. Um, I think we can do that always. And there is um, one, there are, I, there are several examples I would like to give you or several paths. Um, one is, is uh, something that brought, was brought up by Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss, uh, he had a very nice TED talk, so just check it out, about um, uh, what he calls fear setting. And fear setting is a kind of an exercise, mental exercise. Um, he didn't invent it. Um, he, he, he got it from the Stoics. The Stoics were, was a, they were philosophers, a philosophical school in the ancient world, in Greek and then in Rome. And um, the maybe most, most famous Stoic was Seneca. He was a statesman in, in the antique Rome. And these people were famous for their being relaxed, facing any situation, they remained relaxed. So even in front of danger, they remained calm and relaxed. Um, and so how do, did they gain this mental state? And they had the technique. They called it premeditatio malorum. That's a Latin expression. It would translate into an, let's say, anticipating meditation of the worst. So they meditated and anticipated the worst, what could happen. And by anticipating the worst, but really not just like a kind of strange imagination, but really, really they went into it and put it to the extreme. They really made a list of what is the worst things that can happen now. Um, they created something where they were kind of prepared for the worst. So they were always prepared for the worst. So how can you do it? How can you be prepared for the worst? And Tim Ferriss made a very nice exercise out of it. And just look at it. I just explained it very briefly here. So make a list. So for example, you have a decision. Let's say, oh, I made a big mistake in my company. I forgot to send a very important report to our investors and um, bah, uh, now it, we, we, we are too late for the timeline and it's really bad. So, and now, um, now just think about a decision. So you can just try to make it up and maybe try to push the responsibility to somebody else, uh, or you, um, or on the other side, you can just be true. So now let's take the decision of, I would be true. I would go into vulnerability. Um, so now next step is make a list, make a list of what could now happen if I would do that and really make a long list, the, the longer the better. So I would be fired and um, I don't know, I would, would get sued and my wife would get, uh, divorce uh, me because I, I would be, uh, I don't know, um, not, not the, not the um, successful guy anymore. And so whatever it could be, make a big list. So now this is the first very nice step, or very nice, it's a painful step, but it's a very good step because now you have, it's not a somehow strange Im imagination of strange pictures and feelings. It is, you have it on your table, you have it on your paper. And then you do the next step. And the next step is that you 
write in the second column what could you do to prevent these adverse events. So you think about that and it becomes more and more clear. It's not anymore an imagination. It's a very clear scenario. Okay, what could I do to prevent myself of being fired? What could I do to prevent my marriage to break in this situation and so on? So it already starts feeling a little bit better because you see, okay, you're not a victim here. You have a certain possibility to control the outcome of the situation. And now there is a third step. And the third step would be to make a third column and now write into the third column, what would I do if this adverse event would take place? So. If I get fired, okay, what would I do then? Oh, okay, I will look for another job. All right, it's not the best, but I will still I will survive it. I will not I will still be myself. I will still have all my fingers, my hands, my nose will still be on my face, so life will go on. Oh, okay, it's not so bad. So you make this list and it feels already much, much better. Because you see that. What should happen to you really, to your inner core? Nothing is happening to your inner core. Nothing. There will be maybe some changes of the circumstances of your life, but that's all. That's all. And then you can ask yourself the question at the next step. What would, it have, what would be the impact on your life if you would do that? if you would be true here, what would be the impact? And the next step is ask yourself, what would be the costs you have to pay if you don't do it? What would be the costs in the short term, in the mid term and in the long term? So in the short term, yeah, oh, I would have a lot of stress. I would have to be, be nasty to my colleague because I have to push it, push it to him. He would be very disappointed. So I have to hurt somebody else. And um, yeah, on the mid, mid range, uh, mid range, I maybe would, would have a lot of effort to cover all the time. And it will be very hard for me to cover it. And I will always be in fear of not uh, of, of getting, getting exposed. And on the long run, yeah, what would happen then? Yeah, oh my God, I will be a different person. I will be a liar. I will, will be have built my whole life as a house of cards. It's, it's not what I would be. What, it's not who I would like to be in three years or in five years. I want to be a different person. I want to be a true person to myself. So this is just an example on how we can turn, how we can get rid of fears if we put them on the paper. Because it's very interesting, fears, this type of fears, this type of this imaginary, Im Im imagination fears, they have one quality and they always have this quality. It is that they are somehow, they are unclear. They are not very specific. They are not concrete. They are very, very emotional and somehow like ghosts sneaking around the corner in the darkness. It's a dark place. And in the moment where we bring light into this place and we look at it, we will see that there is nothing. The ghost where we were so afraid of this ghost is just a little mouse sneaking in the corner. That's all. It made a lot of noise, the mouse, in the darkness. But we switched the light on it and it's just a mouse. It's nothing else. So this is one way. Another way I would recommend, what is, I would say it's a great thing, is, is um, the work that is proposed by Byron Katie. She called it the work. 
and it's 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 about the past but it can heal a lot in the past and it's again the same approach because what is what is hurting us from the past is always a story about our victimhood about where we are victims of very bad and evil powers and people and so on and what you are doing in the work is to turn it and to put the locus of control to yourself and then you start seeing that it's you and if it's you you have the control and you can change it you can change the reality you can change the story so this is a different this is a second approach i would recommend to you a third approach might be to um, start really with mindfulness meditation. I think this is one of the best, best um, developments in our society that mindfulness meditation now is more and more common. I myself um, meditated for several decades in my life already. And when I, when I started with meditation, when I was around, around about 22 or 23 of age, so it's like 30 years ago, um, it was very uncommon. It was like, oh, these are the meditators, these are the spiritual people, but they are not, not real. They are, they, they are somehow strange guys. They won't be as successful in life. They are not business people or not, not serious science people or so. They are just meditators or something like that. And this has changed a lot. And uh, yeah, because why does it, has it changed? Yeah, because the science has, um, has changed. And the science now has really reached out to our brains and, saw, and, and shows now that the changes that med meditation can do to our brain states and so can do a lot of good to us. And so just find mindfulness meditation teachers um, I just mentioned Sam Harris here at that point uh, but there are many others uh, John Kabat-Zinn for example so there are several very good meditation apps available or or audiobooks where you can learn uh, mindfulness meditation so I would recommend that a lot the next question I ask myself is on my little paper here is the question of how can we help others to become vulnerable? It's a very interesting question. Because I said before, it is a very high goal for the individual to really become vulnerable. It's very hard, really, against a very rough world and environment to become really vulnerable. It's some some people achieve it, but many don't achieve that. So Let's try to help each other. Let's start to help each other to become vulnerable. And so how can we help others to become vulnerable? And I would say there is the foundation of everything here is building up trust. Trust is the foundation for vulnerability in our society. So how can we build up trust? Think about it. What can you do to build up trust? I would say here, <laughs> it's, it's, we have in, in, in Germany, we say the cat bites itself into its tail. So there's like a circle here. Um, because the best way to create trust is to become vulnerable. That's really funny. Um, because as I said, we, we humans, we have a very good sense for truth authenticity um, and so if we feel that somebody is really open really authentic really vulnerable we start trusting this person so the first advice is become vulnerable and you will help others to become also vulnerable so do the first step if you don't do it nobody else will do it just start with that do a little step. Be brave. Do the fear setting first. The fear setting meditation. Think about what would happen if I do that now. Start with a small thing and become true, become vulnerable. 
show something from yourself. Nobody will hurt you. What else can we do to create trust? I would say a very big skill that we all have to learn is to be a listener. Start listening. And it's really an art. To be a real good listener is, is an art. So listening is, is an art. It is really, really hard to really listen. I think mindfulness meditation helps you because mindfulness is listening. Being mindful is listening, in the, I would say, in the very first aspect. And listening means also and leads you also to being em empathic. And being empathic, being listening and being empathic creates trust. And there is another thing. I learned it very late in my life. If you have a dispute with somebody, maybe with your husband or with your wife or with your friend or with your brother or sister or somebody or your colleague, in the very most dis disputes, the key is the emotion. And if you acknowledge the emotion of the other person, you will create trust. And very often you will solve the problem. You will solve the dispute. You will, you will solve the conflict. Because most of the conflicts are not on the level of arguments, but they are on the level of herded emotions. So I know this is really hard because we are also somehow in a defense. We want to defend ourselves. So we are argumenting, arguing. But, and so we always try to make our point. But if we would stop to try making our point and just start listening and listening not only with our brain, but also with our heart, what means here to listen to the emotion of this other person, to understand the emotional state of the other person, and then to acknowledge it. Just acknowledge it. Just tell the other person, show him or her that you are listening. Show it. Repeat what you heard. Let's put an example. I Okay, now I understand that it annoyed you that, that I was late yesterday. And now I can feel how angry it make, made you because you put so much effort into this appointment and now you were disappointed and angry and I can feel that. Okay. And if you acknowledge the feeling of somebody else, there are, there are several points in here. The first is, a feeling is always true. You cannot deny a feeling. A feeling and emotion is always a truth. If somebody is angry, you cannot tell him, no, but you're not angry. Or if somebody is sad, you cannot tell to him, no, you are not sad. Yes, he is sad. And just acknowledge it. It doesn't cost you anything to acknowledge the sadness or the emotion of another person. It's so easy. It's so simple. And... The second thing here is that if you acknowledge the emotion of the other person, it doesn't mean that you give him right that, let's say, if you have a dispute about a certain content, you don't tell him, ah, okay, you're right. No, you just say, okay, I acknowledge it. And you can't just remain on your own standpoint. And you just can say, but I still have a different a different point of view. I still disagree here, but I, yes, I acknowledge your emotion here. I acknowledge you. I acknowledge your story, that this is your story. And then you can just let it be like that and just try that. It's so easy, but I, we forget these things always. And it's the easiest, easiest key to conflict solving. But on the first point, in creating trust. So creating trust is the key to helping others to become vulnerable. 
Okay, and now my last question I have here on my paper is, what can we do for a vulnerable society? <laughs> so what can we do to create a vulnerable society? Ah, that's not so easy. Okay, let's start. We start with ourselves, clear, sure. We start with, with our environment, as I already talked about. We create trust. We create trusting, loving, empathetic environment. We show others that, yeah, that's one world. We are together in this world. But how can we create it in a society? How can we do that? We talk. What I'm doing here making a podcast, talking about it. I think that's an important point. Hmm. Yeah, this is my answer. I only can do that. I can just start spreading around these ideas. And I'm not the only one with these ideas, but I know I'm now one voice here. And the more voices we have talking about those things, the higher is the chance that we create a different type of society. I would say we have today a unique chance as humanity because there was never before a time in, in our history, at least in the known history, where we had a situation like that today. We have today a situation where the whole globe is connected, connected by technology, by Here, what I'm doing, I can reach out. I'm sitting here in a little studio in Germany, in Bavaria, nearby a very beautiful lake. And I'm sitting here. I have some little technical devices. They were not very, very expensive. So I don't have to be a millionaire in order to, be, to, to afford that. And I can reach out. And sure, now at the moment, maybe there are some few hundred people listening it, maybe a few thousand. But there is a chance this information now is in the world and there is a chance that it will reach out many more. And if it reaches out, there are ideas that we put into the heads of, of other humans. And so we can spread out ideas and, and this We can reach so many people. We never had that before. And we can learn from each other. We can just open our little phone and we have the whole entire world in the phone. I mean, we have to be careful because the real world is not in the phone. Um, the real world is our sky above us, is the tree beneath us. Um, um, it is, it is, yeah, the real life. But... But there is a whole world of information, of insights, of thoughts, of emotions that are created. And so there is somebody sitting in Bavaria, in Germany, sitting in his little flat and looking on this little screen. And he can see the discussion of somebody who is in the United States or in India or in China or in Africa or in Australia or in Brazil, or on the North Pole, and shows us life, what he's doing there. And we start, you know, I think the separation always comes out of that we don't know, of ignorance, of that we don't know how others are. So I would say if we go back 100 years in history, when the big wars went over the world, I'm sure that people had strange pictures of the other countries, of the enemies and enemies in their heads, of maybe bad people who, I don't know what, are bad, violent people. But today we look at the little screen and we can see how other people live and that they are all humans, that they all have feelings that they all experience similar things, that they think about similar things, that they have similar fears, but also similar hopes and similar joys, and they all are loving. 
we all are loving beings and we all are connected and we all as i already as i always mention is we all are facing the same destination we are all facing our death that's true let's talk about that let's not deny that and i think that matter of fact that we are facing our own death is is not a morbid point of view it's not a negative thing it's a very positive thing because because facing our own death is a scale our very personal unique scale for our life where do we get a criteria for what is right or wrong in our life if not by this kind of scale that we have an endly life and we all are heading the same to the same destination whatever it is whatever your imagination of it is but it is it is a sure thing it will happen in your life in my life and i think it's it brings meaning in our life it brings a purpose into our life it is the scale of our life ask yourself in the last hour of your life if you would like if you would look back to your life what would be right and what would be wrong then if you look back this is the truth this is your personal truth it's not the truth for everybody but it's your truth and this is what i like so much that we can find our own truth our own scale our own criteria for our acting and this is what i'm talking about if we talk about vulnerability it is becoming true going to your own scale being your own scale and being true with your own scale your own criteria so again something we could do for the society talk about the death okay now this is a interesting end of this podcast but i think i'm 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 through and it's it was an experiment and it, i liked it uh, i will see how the cutting will be um um but i think this is a nice nice um setup for me i would like to do from time to time this solo podcast and the setup is i take an subject as i did now vulnerability and i ask myself i write down myself i wrote down here six questions so five to seven questions on that and then i ask myself and i talk about these questions i ask myself i like that okay so i wish you a good day i wish you a good life i wish you a truthful life a strong life and i would be very happy if you support this little podcast if you could push the thumbs up button it doesn't cost anything um, if you subscribe would be fantastic for me and if you share this with others it would be very great and i want to mention also that there is this patreon patreon page um, it would help us to cover the costs of this journey of this podcast so check it out if you like and so have a good time and thank you mm -hmm.